Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your presence here with us. We come out of a lot of busy places and many activities. We ask you to help us quiet our hearts, to listen carefully to what you're saying to us through your word this morning, and to respond to it in faith and love. We ask in Jesus' name. This morning, we're going to think about how we know something, how we can be confident and sure of something. And to know something, to be confident and sure about anything, certain conditions have to be met. For example, outside of your driver's license, how do you know you're from Maine? Well, you know you're from Maine if you fulfill certain conditions. Some of these conditions relate to the weather. You know you're from Maine if you call four inches of snow a dustin. You can feel free to raise your hand if you identify with any of these statements. You know you're from Maine if it rains hard and you say, imagine if this was snow. <laughs> you know you're from Maine if, if you develop an emotional attachment to your local meteorologist. Our family loves Keith Carson, Channel 6's weatherman. Some of these conditions relate to gas stations. You know you're from Maine if you know what an Irving is and where 15 of them are. <laughs> and you know if you're from Maine if you've ever bought a whoopie pie at an Irving. <laughs> I was in one yesterday and there was the whoopie pie right at the checkout counter. But I had already bought a bag of Mrs. Dunphy's donuts so I didn't need it. Mentioning food, you know you're from Maine if your definition of a perfect meal is baked beans, hot dogs, and brown bread from a can. <laughs> Some of these conditions relate to language. You know you're from Maine if you call the basement down cellar. You know you're from Maine if you know that stove up has nothing to do with cooking. <laughs> I'm almost done with this. Some of these conditions relate to neighboring states. You know you're from Maine if you've ever shopped in New Hampshire to avoid paying Maine sales tax. <laughs> Guilty as charged. You know you're from Maine if you see some really bad driving and you check the car's license plate to see if it's from Massachusetts. <laughs> Once again, guilty as charged. Things like knowing whether you're from Maine or not are relatively unimportant in the grand scheme of things. But knowing other things, being confident and sure of things, can be vitally important. When I was a kid, my hero, thanks to Disney, was Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. I had the fake coonskin cap and imagined myself doing similar exploits, except, of course, getting killed at the Alamo. According to Disney, Davy Crockett's motto was, be sure you're right, and then go ahead. And if you don't know you're right, if you're not confident and sure of it, it can be difficult and dangerous to go ahead. For example, I've, I've climbed Mount Katahdin many times, and Lord willing, I hope to do so at least one more time this summer as a 73-year-old, but if you're not sure you're heading in the right direction, climbing Mount Katahdin is not only difficult, it's dangerous. Many of you have probably read a book called Lost on a Mountain in Maine. It tells how Don Fendler, a 12-year-old boy scout, was lost on Mount Katahdin and wandered in the Maine woods for nine days because he last lost track of the trail markers in the fog. He didn't know for certain which direction to go, and it almost cost him his life. When it comes to the matter of one's eternal destiny, it's vitally important to be sure you're on the trail that leads to heaven, to know that you belong to God, to be confident that your sins are forgiven, to know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Are you sure that you're a child of God and he's forgiven your sins? Are you confident that you're on the way to heaven? 
do you know you belong to him? When I shared the good news about Jesus with my dad during a serious hospitalization he was experiencing, he said, I believe everything you've said, but how can you be sure? Knowing we belong to God, being confident of our relationship with him, is extremely important for us as we go through life seeking to follow Jesus. We need to know we're right as we go ahead. And as we read through this letter of 1 John, the conditions we must fulfill to be confident of our relationship with God are obvious. Confidence we belong to God is supported by loving other believers. It's based on faith in the Lord Jesus. It's experienced through the presence of the Holy Spirit. All three of those conditions for confidence are found in the passage we're looking at this morning, 1 John 3, 18 to 24. Look for them as we read these verses. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Based on this passage, confidence we belong to God is supported by loving other believers. It begins with little children. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. What does it mean to love someone in deed and truth instead of just in word or talk? The Bible seems to define love as taking the initiative to seek another's good by meeting their need. God loved us when he took the initiative to seek our good by meeting our need for salvation. He loved us by coming into the world and dying for our sins. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, that is, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The next verse tells us to follow God's loving example. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. In following our Lord's example, we love other believers when we take the initiative to seek their good by meeting their needs with our time, our talents, and our treasure. And love involves a willingness to sacrifice these things for the good of another. The two verses before our passage this morning mention this. In 1 John 3, 16 and 17, it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Giving our time, talents, and treasure to help another believer is not always easy or convenient. In fact, I would say it's usually not easy or convenient. Earlier this summer, after a message from one of our pastors that emphasized loving one another, a friend from Moss Brook came up to me after church and asked me for some help. He's sitting right over there with a baseball cap on. If you know David Stickney, you know, he's an 87-year-old. Oh, sorry to give that away. But he's an 87-year-old who has lived a life full of adventure and is still looking for more. His latest adventure is moving to Bulgaria, where he already owns a house. He asked me if I could help him drive two cars and a trailer to Hillside, New Jersey, near Newark, where one car and the trailer would be stored and then shipped to Bulgaria. I don't have many talents, but one of them is enjoying driving, even, even long distances. So I said, I can help with that. I plan to take a Friday off from work to do so. Meanwhile, 
My wife, Margot, kept telling me that she had a very bad feeling about this trip and that she thought I shouldn't do it. It reminded me of Pontius Pilate's wife telling him that she'd had a dream about Jesus and that he shouldn't have anything to do with Jesus. Now, my wife's intuitions are usually right, and they were in this case, but I still felt this was something the Lord wanted me to do to help out my brother in Christ. What I didn't know was the two cars were a 1971 Volvo that hadn't been driven for 20 years until this summer, and a 2004 Honda Civic with 334,000 miles and no working air conditioner. Here's what happened. A half hour into the trip, gasoline spilled from a container in the trunk of the Civic I was driving and saturated the floor of the trunk. Well, after wiping, much wiping with paper towels from a gas station, we continued with the smell of gasoline filling the car for the next 24 hours. 10 miles outside of New York City, I noticed in my rearview mirror, David's Volvo, which was towing the trailer, slowly pulled to the side of I-95. Getting off the highway at the next exit and circling around from the previous exit to where he was parked, I pulled in behind him to find the car was disabled with a likely distributor problem. So after sitting in the breakdown lane with busy traffic flying by, a help vehicle and tow truck eventually arrived. Tow truck driver towed the Volvo and the trailer off the highway, then announced that he worked for the New York State Thruway and getting to New Jersey was our problem. We called AAA again, and eventually AAA showed up and told us they could only tow the Volvo, not the trailer. So we hooked the trailer up to the Civic, and I began towing it behind the tow truck driver. About two miles from the George Washington Bridge, the tow truck driver exited I-95 and began a much longer circular route down the east side of Manhattan, around the south end, and back up the west side towards the George Washington Bridge. I don't know why he did that. It was probably 10 miles. Well, anyway, we're inching along in this New York City Friday afternoon rush hour traffic when a little Mazda begins crowding the tow truck for lane space. And then, surprisingly, it actually runs into the tow truck and causes damage to it. So that now, we spend the next 20 minutes stopped behind the tow truck in this Friday rush hour traffic with cars going by on each side while a AAA driver has an animated conversation with the driver of the Mazda. <laughs> well, once we finally started up again and eventually made our way to the east end of the bridge, a downpour started. But we couldn't roll our windows up because of the gas smell and no working air conditioner. <laughs> then the inside of the windshield fogged up as we were trying to follow our truck. By the grace of God, we made it over the bridge and eventually found our way to the shipping facility in New Jersey. However, the multiple delays had made us so late they had closed for the weekend and locked their gates to the storage area. A security guard informed us he could not open the gate and we could not leave the trailer in the car in the parking area outside the gate. A phone call to David's agent in California yielded no help. It looked like we might be spending the weekend in Hillside, New Jersey. Thankfully, as an answer to prayer, the AAA tow driver contacted a local towing and storage company who would accept the car and trailer and deliver it on Monday. And we left the Volvo and trailer there. Now we're about 15 hours into our trip. So David and I headed up the west side of the Hudson in the smelly Honda, making a wide swath around the George Washington Bridge and crossing back over at Newburgh, New York. I fueled myself with a 32-ounce cup of Diet Mountain Dew laced with a bottle of five-hour energy, <laughs> and we headed for home. We arrived back at 5.30 a.m. the next morning, 24 hours after we started. And during that last leg, David regaled me with hours of stories from his adventure-filled life 
And we had added one more adventure to that. So this was my attempt to love a brother in Christ in deed and truth, and not just in word and talk. And I share the details not to make you realize that I should pay more careful attention to what my wife is telling me, <laughs> but to underline the fact that using our time and talents and treasure to seek the good of another is often not convenient or comfortable, but it is an indication we are part of God's family. And for me, despite the difficulty, the result was worthwhile. David's note to me afterwards said, thanks a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> the Apostle John says in verses 19 and 20 that a lifestyle of loving other believers supports our confidence that we belong to God when our heart condemns us. It says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. These two verses don't explain why our heart condemns us, but it isn't hard for us to imagine. We're very much aware that we all sin and fall short of God's perfect character. We often do what we shouldn't and fail to do what we should. And when we fail like this, our guilty consciences plague us with doubts, sometimes making us wonder whether we even belong to God or not. On top of this, our enemy, the devil, loves to accuse us, to discourage us from even trying to follow Jesus faithfully. And you know how he works. When tempting us, he says, this is just a little thing. One time won't hurt. If we yield to the temptation, then he jumps on us with, now you've really blown it. How you could do such a thing? What makes you think you're a Christian? And whether it's our own sensitive conscience or the devil's accusations, there are times when our heart condemns us. At such times, how do we reassure our hearts that we truly belong to God? First, we reassure our hearts, hearts by reminding ourselves of our practice of love for other believers. We shift our view from the immediate failure to the larger picture and the longer practice of loving obedience. Sometimes we can't see how beautiful the forest is because we're focused on the individual ugly tree right in front of us. So when doubts arise, we need to look at the larger picture of our life of love. And second, we reassure our hearts by remembering that God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. He doesn't miss the big picture. He knows where our affections truly lie. He knows that at the core of our being, we love him and want to please him. There's a great example of the Apostle Peter appealing to God's greater knowledge of all things after an abysmal failure. The night before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times, a failure which caused him to weep bitterly over that sin. And after the resurrection, when Jesus asked him for the third time if Peter loved him, it broke Peter's heart. He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He appealed to Jesus' greater knowledge of even Peter's own heart condition. And when we're doubting our relationship with God because of some failure, we need to remember that God knows better than our sensitive consciences will allow us to affirm. He knows all things. He knows our hearts inside and out, and so he knows those who truly belong to him. And we can reassure ourselves with his greater knowledge. As we look at our passage again in 1 John 3, verses 21 and 22, we see what great freedom in prayer we have when our heart does not condemn us. It says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. When we're following Jesus closely and our hearts are free from self-condemnation, we become confident in prayer. We know that we can come to our heavenly father in prayer and our requests will be heard and answered. 
I think we can understand this confidence in terms of our family relationships. When do children feel most confident that their parents will hear their requests and grant them? When they've been disobedient and are being disciplined for it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> they're most confident when they're living as obedient children and enjoying a close relationship with their parents. And so it is with us and our Heavenly Father. The more closely we walk with Him, the more boldness and confidence we have in prayer. Now, this doesn't give us a blank check because we must ask in faith and according to God's will, but it encourages us to do what the writer of Hebrews says, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So then confidence we belong to God is supported by loving other believers. The next thing we learn here is that confidence we belong to God is based on faith in Jesus. And verse 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Well, what does it mean to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ? To truly believe in Jesus means to accept the gospel facts about Jesus as true. The first fact is that he was the unique Son of God, as the Father testified. Both at Jesus' baptism and again on the Mount of Transfiguration when his divine glory was allowed to shine through his humble humanity, God the Father spoke from heaven with an audible voice. And on each occasion he said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The second fact is that he died on the cross in our place and for our sins. And the third fact is that God raised him from the dead. It's been said that the good news about Jesus can be summed up in eight words. Christ died for our sins and rose again. But genuine faith involves more than merely accepting these facts about Jesus as true. Simply ac accepting the gospel facts about Jesus as true is not all there is to believing. It's a merely intellectual faith. Now, that merely intellectual faith is the kind of faith my, my wife, Margot, has in ibuprofen. And like many nurses I know, she seems to have an aversion to medicine. She knows ibuprofen is capable of relieving pain. That is, if you take at least three tablets, I have on good authority. But she seldom takes it. She doesn't rely on its ability to relieve. And there's no rejoicing in her heart in the truthfulness of that fact. She'd rather go to bed with a headache and hope she can go to sleep so the headache will go away. Her intellectual faith leads to no fondness for the product, no emotional appreciation. But truly believing in Jesus involves much more than merely accepting the facts about him. It includes loving him and rejoicing in what he has done for me. To truly believe in Jesus means to love the Lord Jesus as my savior and to rejoice in him. And so the apostle Peter writes, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So true faith in Jesus must include this emotional element of love for and joy in the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And think about it. How can we not love and rejoice in someone whom we know has given his life for us? But genuine faith involves more than a merely emotional response to the truth of the gospel. This is the kind of faith, this emotional faith, is the kind of faith I have in the Boston Red Sox. My uncle started taking me to Red Sox games when I was 12, and I accept the truthfulness of their claim to be New England's team and simply cannot understand how any Mainer could ever root for the Yankees or the Mets. My heart rejoices in their considerable skill in playing baseball, and they give me joy when I see them win. 
but stake anything important on their winning a big game? Not on your life. They've let me down too many times for that. Think about their World Series performances. This is all in my lifetime. Lost in seven games in 1967. Lost in seven games in 1975. And I still remember sitting up late at night watching the sixth game of the 86 World Series. It's the ninth inning. The Red Sox are two runs ahead. There's two outs. There's nobody on base. And there's two strikes on the batter. And I remember sitting there thinking, they're going to win the World Series. But they lost. <laughs> they lost. And at that moment, I knew they were going to lose the seventh game the next day. And they did. My problem is my emotional attachment to them is not genuine faith, because genuine faith really trusts its object. OK, so they have won four World Series in the last 20 years. And they look better this year. My faith is growing. But look how the last two years ended, last place. My point about all of this is to say that genuine faith involves more than a merely emotional response to the truth of the gospel. To truly believe in Jesus means to personally appropriate and rely upon him as our savior. In his gospel, the apostle John wrote this about Jesus, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is genuine faith. It not only accepts the facts about Jesus as true and rejoices in him, it chooses to act upon those facts by welcoming him into our life and placing our eternal destiny into his hands. My relationship to my dad and airplanes is an example of truly believing. When I was a kid, my dad owned a 1940 vintage J4 Piper Cub, a two-passenger fabric-covered float plane. And I flew with my dad in that plane into all sorts of backcountry northern lakes and ponds, primarily to go trout fishing. But I never wanted to learn to fly because I didn't really trust airplanes. We say then, well, why did you get into that plane so many times if you don't trust airplanes? Because I trusted my dad, the skilled mechanic who maintained the engine and the skilled pilot who flew the plane. I was willing to entrust my life and health to his care. If we can trust highly skilled but fallible human beings with our physical safety, should we not be able to trust the perfect son of God with our spiritual safety? To truly believe in Jesus means to personally appropriate and rely upon him as our savior. So confidence we belong to God is not only supported by loving other believers, and based on faith in Jesus, confidence we belong to God is experienced through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. John will repeat the same thought in the next chapter. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The Bible tells us that whenever someone puts their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, God sends his Holy Spirit to live in their hearts to make real to them their new relationship with God. The Bible says, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. God, the Holy Spirit, bears direct witness to our hearts that we belong to our heavenly Father as his children and thus share in his eternal life. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How does this work? How does the Holy Spirit let us know we belong to God? How do I hear the witness of the Spirit? Here's how I think this works. I hear the Spirit's testimony when I read God's promises of salvation in the Bible, and he assures me that they are true in my case. John 3.16 would be an example of one such promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. And when I read those words, I hear the Holy Spirit silently testifying to my heart. That promise is true, and it's true for you. God did give his son for you because he loved you. And because you have trusted in Jesus, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. This is how the Holy Spirit gives me confidence that I belong to God. He reassures us God's promises of forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life are true for us personally. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, he also begins to transform us to be more like Jesus. The Christ-like character that he produces in us is called the fruit of the Spirit. And when the Apostle Paul lists the various aspects of this Christ-like character the Spirit produces in us, the very first aspect he mentions is love. And so the love for other believers that supports our confidence we belong to God is ultimately the Holy Spirit's work, the one who came to live in our hearts when we trusted in Jesus as our Savior. The three conditions for confidence that we belong to God all come together in our passage. Confidence we belong to God is supported by loving other believers. It's based on faith in Jesus. It's experienced through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this not only assures us of our salvation, but encourages us to pray, knowing that our Heavenly Father will hear and answer our prayers. It's not just that we wish we belong to God, or that we hope we belong to God. Based on God's word, we can know that we belong to God. This is not arrogance. It is simple faith, and it leads to confidence. John nails it down in 1 John 5.13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this confidence that you work in our hearts through your word and by your spirit and out into our lives that we belong to you. We know, Lord, this has nothing to do with our attempts to try to please or obey you, but it has everything to do with trusting in what your son, the Lord Jesus, has done for us by dying and rising again. Lord, as we remember him in the the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. We ask that you might fill our hearts with a greater love for all that you have done for us and a greater determination and ability to walk faithfully with you. We pray in Jesus' name.